All right, let's take our Bibles and go to Luke chapter 2, if you will, the Gospel of Luke and the second chapter for our message this morning, the incarnation of our King, Luke chapter 2. And we're going to look at some familiar verses at this Christmas time to us, uh, verses 1 through 7, if you'll note them there in the Word of God with me. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The miracle of the incarnation happened only once and it will never need to happen again. You know, the miracles of the Bible are exciting to read. And we read throughout Scripture, both Old and New Testament, of God's hand working in a miraculous way. And many of those miracles happen time and time again. I think of the people that were healed of, of lameness or blindness or uh, their ears were open to be able to hear. And that happened time after time after time throughout the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of the feeding of, of uh, the thousands with just a few loaves of bread. That didn't happen just once. It happened more than once. The miracles of the Bible are often repeated. The casting out of demons, the salvation of souls has happened hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times. I hope you understand that your salvation is a miracle of God. And all across this auditorium this morning are representatives of the miracle of salvation. But this miracle of the incarnation took place only once. God, incarnate, in caro, God in the flesh. What an amazing thing. God, the creator of the universe, the one that eye has never seen, one that we must worship this morning in spirit and in truth, but God becoming flesh, incarnate, assuming flesh by God. This gracious voluntary act of the Son of God in assuming a human body and a human nature. One person, Jesus Christ, one person with two natures indissolubly united. The one nature being that of the eternal Son of God, the other that of man, in all respects human, yet without sin. This incarnation, this miracle was going to require a miracle in its conception. It was going to require a miraculous birth. And it is absolutely unparalleled in human history. Do you understand this morning that this incarnation of our King is what Christmas is all about? Christmas is different this year, isn't it? I mean, everything's different this year. COVID-19 has certainly impacted Christmas. It's different. It's changed everything. Christmas travel, Christmas eating out, or should I say eating in? Christmas shopping, Christmas gatherings, Christmas church services, all different. The pandemic has certainly affected Christmas, but no pandemic can alter in one iota this miracle of the incarnation of our King. I want you to see with me this morning three amazing aspects of this miracle of the incarnation of our King, Jesus Christ. Notice, first of all, the orchestration of this incarnation. You know, miracles, though often instantaneous, do not just happen. They're not just happenstance. 
They're not circumstantial. Uh, they don't just uh, uh, come along out of the blue, we would say. This miracle of the incarnation was not a coincidence. This miracle of the incarnation was not happenstance. It just didn't happen because everything just kind of lined up just right according to human planning or human ingenuity. We see in this orchestration the prophecy of God himself. You know, it's interesting in the Old Testament when the Bible speaks of the coming Messiah, the coming Christ, it speaks of him in human form. It talks about this Messiah being the seed of a woman. It talks about the Messiah being a descendant of Abraham, of Judah, and of David. In Isaiah 53, as the Messiah is described there in full detail, he is called a man of sorrows. So we see the prophecy of God showing us the human form but also in the Old Testament, Jesus, this coming Messiah, is described in divine form. He is called the mighty God. He's called the everlasting Father. He's called the Son of God. He's called the Lord, our righteousness. So even in God's prophecy in the Old Testament, we see the incarnation, this indissoluble union of God and man, the prophecy of God. But notice also working alongside the prophecies of God was the proclamation of government. Now Jesus is born here during the reign of Augustus Caesar, during this fourth monarchy of the Roman Empire. At this point in time, the Roman Empire has reached its hands all across the known world. In fact, the Roman Empire at this time was called the empire of the whole earth. All of the civilized world was connected in some way to the Roman Empire at this point in history and in many ways was dependent upon that Roman Empire. Judea was a province of this empire, a tributary, if you please. Jerusalem had been conquered by Pompey, the Roman uh, general, 60 years prior to the birth of Jesus Christ. And Judea was ruled by Serenius, the governor of Syria, as our text tells us. Now this taxing that is spoken of here in Luke chapter two, which was really a census, it was a registering with this Roman empire, this taxing was the first that was made in Judea. It was the first badge, so to speak, of their servitude to the Roman Empire. Isn't it interesting that 600 years before Christ, Isaiah prophesied of, of Jesus Christ being born, the Messiah. Uh, hundreds of years before this account, we see Micah telling us that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And so we have the prophecy of God, but we have the proclamation now of government that all the world should be taxed. All the world should be registered with the Roman Empire, working hand in hand, the prophecy of God and the pronouncement of government. In Micah chapter five and verse two, but thou Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands in Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me he that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. Ladies and gentlemen, don't let the government worry you. I, I know we're all concerned about it. We're all wondering what's going to happen next. What are they going to think of next to do to us? Uh, what's this new presidency going to be like and all of those things? They all go through our minds, but, but don't, don't get too worried about the government. The king's hand is in the heart. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Listen, God's working this all together. We know what the scriptures say. We, we can read the end times. We can know what's coming down the pike. And God is orchestrating government right alongside. These people don't even know what they're doing. This, this, this governor uh, 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 of Syria, he didn't know what he was proclaiming here when he decided 60 years after taking over that now he was going to have this registry of people, this taxing of people. But God knew. God had it all working hand in hand. The prophecy of God, 
the proclamation of government. And notice the precision of guidance. Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem as a result of the prophecies of God, the proclamation of the government. They arrive in Bethlehem exactly at the time of Jesus' birth. Verse four says, it just so happened. It miraculously happened that Jesus Christ was born at this exact place. Bethlehem means the house of bread. And it was here in Bethlehem, the house of bread, that the bread of life would be born. Bethlehem, the city of David. Why? Because Jesus was called the son of David. You see, God is orchestrating every part of this miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, this incarnation. History is his story. And God is carefully orchestrating things in our lives today. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. We don't have to get upset. We can trust our sovereign God who is orchestrating everything according to his plan. A man's heart deviseth his own way, but God directeth his steps. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. No matter what your checkbook looks like, no matter what your relationships look like, no matter what your past, what your present, or what you think is your future, you can be sure that God is in control. The orchestration of the incarnation. But notice secondly, the obedience in this incarnation. God has a miraculous plan to send his son, Jesus Christ, to this world to be our savior. But there were some individuals in this incarnation who had to be obedient for it to take place. And I want you to see the obedience in the incarnation. We see a promised visit. God had told us way back in the Old Testament, 600 years before this birth would occur, that Jesus Christ was going to be born. He had promised this visit of God to the earth. In Isaiah 7 and verse 14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh, God incarnate. In Isaiah 9, in verse 6, it says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. To Mary, God said in Luke chapter 1, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. So a promised visit. But what if Jesus had said no? What if God said, okay, son, it's time for you to go and fulfill all of this prophecy of the Old Testament. It's time for you now to go to the earth and become flesh. What if the son had said no? Jesus Christ had to obey, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. What a beautiful obedience that is of the son to the father. In John 8 and verse 29, Jesus said, I do always the things that please him. The obedience of the son, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth, a promised visit. But notice also a pure virgin. Here was Mary. Another individual in this story that had to be obedient. Go back to Luke chapter 1, if you will, and let's read a bit about it in Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. And the sixth month 
The angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Mary is suddenly given this amazing news that she is going to bear the Messiah. And she's troubled. There's confusion in her heart. Look down at verse number 34. Then said Mary to the angel, how shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. and The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. This miraculous virgin birth, this miraculous conception in the heart of, of, of Mary. Look at verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary, this obedient servant, we all think it'd be a wonderful thing to be used by God. We think, boy, Lord, it would be great if you could use me in some significant way. If you could use me for something eternal, something significant that would change the world. God, I, I would like to be used in that way. Well, let me ask us, are we obedient? Are we pure? Are we usable? Perhaps there are things you're praying for at this Christmas time. Perhaps to be used of God to witness to a family member. Perhaps to be used of God in, in some neighbor's life. To perhaps be a blessing in some way to the work of God. And you're asking God, would you use me? But are we usable? Are we pure? Are we obedient? You see, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. May it be our prayer, Christian, at this Christmas time that we would be a vessel of honor, that we would be a vessel that's pure and clean and usable in the hand of God, that we would be obedient to whatever his voice would speak to us about. Here was a pure virgin a promised visit, but then notice a pliable vessel. In verse five, and we read it several times in Luke chapter two and Luke chapter one, this matter of Joseph and Mary being espoused. It's a word that we do not hear much about today or think much about today, this espousal. Joseph and Mary were espoused. What does that mean? Some would say, well, it's, it's like engagement, but that is not true. Engagement is a commitment in Western civilization, particularly on the part of the guy who forks out an amazing amount of money to put a ring on a girl's finger. But there's really no, there's no punishment if somewhere along the way in that engagement that things don't work out. In fact, it happens quite often. Statistics say 65% of the time it happens. So engagement is not a binding legal kind of agreement. It is a commitment to be sure and a, and a planning to be sure of eventual marriage. A spousal, however, under Jewish custom was quite different. In fact, in the Old Testament, if you want to study it later, when a man and a woman were espoused, there was only one way out of that commitment. And that was if one of them 
committed fornication. Then the innocent person could go to the priest and obtain a writing of divorcement. And they were legally then divorced. The person who was innocent was allowed to go on and marry someone else at his choosing. The person who had committed the fornication was stoned to death. So when Joseph receives this news that Mary is with child, he's pretty concerned. In fact, he's downright afraid. In Luke chapter, I'm sorry, in, in, in uh, Mark chapter, or Matthew chapter one, listen to what it says. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. When Joseph received this news, he thought, what am I going to do? I love Mary. I was planning to be her husband. But now she's with child. I'm not the father. She has committed fornication. And Joseph is minded to put her away. He's minded to go to the priest to let them know that she must be stoned, put away. But the next verse says, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. The same angel that had to come to Mary and announce this good news of the incarnation had to also appear to Joseph. Why? Because Joseph was going to have to be obedient as well. Joseph was going to have to be willing to say, yes, Lord, this is your plan. This is your will. And I'm okay with it. Are we? Oh, we fret. We complain. We resist when life takes its twists and turns. When life doesn't quite treat us the way we think it should treat us. When hardships come, when difficulties come, and we don't understand what is going on, we begin to rebel, we begin to resist, we, we begin to say no to God. Joseph was in that spot where he could have easily said, I'm out. I'm out of this plan. But Joseph, by faith as well, responds to the message of God and is obedient. We see the obedience in the incarnation, the promised visit, Jesus willing to come to this earth, the pure virgin Mary willing to be this handmaid of the Lord, and then Joseph being that pliable vessel, which leads us now to not only the orchestration of the incarnation and the obedience in the incarnation, but notice the outcome of this incarnation. What is the result of all of this story? What is this all about? Why God in man? Why incarnate? Well, God designed for Jesus Christ to take on an earthly dwelling. Emmanuel, God with us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That which was from the beginning, John said, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which our hands have handled. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Jesus Christ became flesh, dwelt among us. But why? Why this earthly dwelling? Because God in his love had designed an eternal deliverance. 
Luke 19 and verse 10, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This whole story is about the very fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. An eternal deliverance. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The father that gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Jesus came here in Bethlehem these many Christmases ago. The house of bread to become the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth in me shall never thirst. All that the father giveth to me shall come to me. And he that cometh to me I'll in no wise cast out. God didn't send a vaccine for the sick. He sent his son to bring victory for the soul. Tomorrow, we're told, in hospitals all across the country, a vaccine will be delivered. This much anticipated help in a pandemic, this hope, this perhaps deliverance, Oh, it'll be at the hospitals. Mount Sinai here in Los Angeles will have the vaccine, we're told. And people are excited. Perhaps this will all end. Perhaps by the end of the summer, they're saying, we won't have to worry about coronavirus anymore. A vaccine, our hope. But oh, listen, God sent something far more important than a vaccine. He sent victory for the soul. Well, I'm thankful for vaccine. Warp speed, they say. Developed, now gotten into the hands of hospitals and to the people. Warp speed, it's called. Much faster than it's ever been done before. But I'll tell you what, there's something called salvation that is warp speed. And today, if you'll simply acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner and you will ask Jesus Christ to be your savior, that's exactly why he came. And instantaneously, you can be born again, victory over sin and death and hell and be on your way to heaven. Christian, he didn't come just to give life. He came to bring abundant life. And today, if you and I will simply humble ourselves and put ourselves aside and obey our king, Oh, listen, he'll bring contentment. He'll bring joy. He'll bring fulfillment to your life at warp speed because he is our savior. He is our king. And today we celebrate his incarnation. 